Welcome everyone to the evening lecture for Interregnum 17, XVII. Um, before we get started, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to President Gibson and Provost Sisley for their continued support of these competitions, especially in light of the circumstances of this past year. Um, I would also like to thank the committee, uh, Ellen, Catherine, Emma, Chris, Raven, and Kaylee, uh, along with our advisors, Letitia and Dr. Tubbs, uh, they've been a huge help this year. Um, as you all hopefully have realized at this point, this year's interregnum theme is reconciliation. Uh, when we chose this word as our theme this summer, our country was in the midst of a conversation resulting from the death of George Floyd, and we were reckoning with a history of division and death based on racism and wrongdoing. Um, the struggle and division our nation hasn't subsided since then. In many ways, we've only grown more aware of the seemingly intractable sins of our histories and our communities. So this year we've walked through a conversation. We looked at Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address and we saw the roots of injustice and the cost of trying to rectify the great sin of slavery. We looked at MLK's, what is your life's blueprint for a hopeful promise of peace? We looked at John M. Perkins' let justice roll down and saw that reconciliation requires not only authentic repentance and otherworldly forgiveness, but also systematic communal change over time. And we looked at Gilead by Marilyn Robinson to see the complex burden of reconciliation on families and individuals. And we looked at Hosea to see God's promise of final reconciliation, but with a sobering reminder that sustained injustice must be and will be wiped out as God remakes his people. Along the way, we heard from esteemed professors about how to begin the process of reconciliation. We heard about the concept of biblical justice and why reconciliation so often fails. Um, our question this year has not been so much, should we reconcile? As Christians, we've been called to be ministers of reconciliation to the world, but our question has been more, what is reconciliation? And we have an even more pressing question on top of that, which is, how do we reconcile? And we've tried to piece together the answer to this question as we balance between the powerful demands of repentance and forgiveness and compassion and recompense and justice and hope and peace, um, which brings us to this evening. So tonight, I am very honored and thrilled to introduce you to the esteemed theologian and scholar, Dr. Miroslav Wolf. He's the Henry B. White Professor of Theology at Yale Divinity School and the founder and director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Dr. Wolf has published 20 books and over 100 articles, including the acclaimed work Exclusion and Embrace, a Theological Exploration of Identity, Otherness, and Reconciliation. He has also led prominent conversations on Muslim-Christian interfaith relations and ecum ecumenical agreement. Uh, we are honored to have such an accomplished and thoughtful voice here with us tonight. Uh, I'm really excited to turn it over to him in just a moment. Um, but uh, the structure for tonight is going to look like this. Uh, he'll uh, lecture for a, a little while. And during that time, uh, you know, obviously we're going to sit tight and we're going to listen <laughs> attentively. But also, uh, as you have questions during that time, you can send them over to the phone number that will be in the chat. Uh, Dr. Wolf has expressed his enthusiasm at hearing your questions. So we'll try to answer uh, as, many as, as many of them as we can in, in our allotted time. Uh, and I'm going to be moderating the question and answer session uh, following the lecture. And then just as a logistical note uh, for the students here, you can receive credit by filling out the Google form that will be posted at the end of the lecture. Um, but I'm sure you're tired of hearing me and very ready to hear Dr. Wolf. So I'll turn it over to him now. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Well, good evening to everyone. And Micah, thank you for contacting me and for all the work that you and uh, the whole team that is there uh, have done uh, organizing these um, conversations and lectures uh, about reconciliation. Um, given the roster of speakers that you've had, uh, it, it's clear that, that this is a, a weighty and important topic and that you've taken it with a great deal of seriousness. Um, I really appreciate that, uh, partly because my own um, work over the 25 now, maybe 30 years, uh, has been to a large extent, um, or at least has had one significant focus in reconciliation, because I find the reconciliation to be fundamental to our lives as Christians uh, in this world, uh, both, as Michael already mentioned, reconciliation with God, but also uh, and um, uh, inseparably reconciliation between uh, between people. Just today I was uh, um, leading a Bible study and uh, I uh, talked about the verse in First John, how can you say that you uh, love your neighbor who you do not see? 
uh, how, do you, how can you say that you love God who you do not see, but hate the neighbor who you do see? And there the point is that the two loves, love for God and love for neighbor are completely inseparable. And I can give you a whole lecture on that, which is a wonderful topic to, to explore. But our topic is reconciliation, related to it, but distinct. And first, let me give some preliminary remarks um, uh, on the kind of reconciliation I will be addressing. Um, then uh, um, kind of my own background and the kind of personal background with, with reconciliation. And then I will uh, take um, a kind of uh, some a key element uh, of the book Exclusion and Embrace that I have published on the, on the topic, um, um, uh, um, the idea of embrace and, and try to give you something like uh, a phenomenology of embraced, which is at the same time response to the question, uh, what does it take? And how does one kind of imagine reconciliation uh, happening? If we have time, I'll address the questions of um, um, need to remember, uh, what is uh, forgiveness, uh, apology, uh, reparation uh, as a structural elements uh, of, uh, of reconciliation. So it's a big uh, topic and uh, my assumption was that you want me to speak in, in, in general uh, terms about reconciliation, then we can delve into specifics when we um, have our Q&A session. So first, uh, some few preliminary remarks. Uh, and one of them concerns the types of uh, reconciliation. And, uh, and you can analyze this in different ways, obviously, but I, I, one can distinguish, at least it seems to me plausible to distinguish between something like political reconciliation and then cultural reconciliation and personal reconciliation. Now, political reconciliation concerns situation in which a state or state actors have committed significant wrong, primarily in violating human rights. Uh, and that may be both at the interstate between states, but also within the state. The crucial thing is um, uh, uh, state actors are the agents uh, who have perpetrated a wrongdoing, uh, and reconciliation involves that. The cultural reconciliation concerns situations in which communities and persons who are member of particular communities, ethnic, racial, cultural, religious groups are in conflict and great many of the conflicts in the world today in some sense involve this cultural moment or are primarily about cultural reconciliation. And then finally, there is personal reconciliation and that concerns situations in which individuals, often members of uh, same ethnic group, but sometimes of diverse ethnic groups, but often members of the same ethnic religious, cultural, subcultural group are at odds with one another. You know, typical situations is family feuds, right? Or friendships that break down or work uh, um, relations are sour and uh, wrongdoing happens and reconciliation needs to take place. Now in this uh, lecture tonight, I will primarily be speaking about personal reconciliation and this cultural reconciliation, or as I've done in the book, Exclusion and Embrace, it will be a kind of personal reconciliation between people whose identities have been inflected by belonging to a particular group. So uh, in my case, um, um, and the uh, situation which I describe often is uh, how do I as a Croatian relate to a Serb when our two groups have been historically in conflict. Similar situation is here often, not always, uh, but often um, in terms of, uh, you can have similar situation in terms, of, in terms of race. So I will speak about this personal cultural uh, nexus of reconciliation. Now, second, I want to just point out to you that um, for me, the idea of reconciliation and forgiveness that is at the heart of uh, reconciliation has always been not just a theological interest or broadly the theoretical scholarly interest, but it's been always a personal uh, interest. And personal interest 
um, with with a dimension of the of the political always attached to it. Uh, one of my first experiences as a child was, um, uh, and I can remember it uh, as event only in telling of my parents was the death of my my brother. His name was Daniel. He was five, and he was killed by negligence of a of a soldier. Soldier, um, and my father and mother, independently of each other. Uh, had the same verse come to them as they were reflecting and grieving of this uh, uh, about this death, uh, death, and the verse was, um, um, "Receive one another as Christ have uh, as as uh, that's Ephesians." Now I'm I'm blanking on the on the verse, but but forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you uh, in Christ, and they applied it to this situation, and in a sense, the entire family dynamic was always. Uh, Daniel and that forgiveness over Daniel's death was part and parcel of our lives. I've given a little bit of a report on this and this stimulated my thinking about forgiveness in my little book on free of charge. Uh, the other personal, very personal experience was um, uh, when I was a little bit older uh, in my 20s, I was uh, conscripted into um, the army, communist army. And there, because I was a son of a minister, I was myself ordained as a minister. Um, I was a professor of theology, teaching theology, studying theology abroad. I was married to uh, someone from, from abroad. And I was suspected of being some kind of a American spy, connections with CIA. And during my time in the then communist army, I was subject to, uh, to, to extended interrogations. And, but this resulted, uh, of course, in the, in the internal struggle over this wrongdoing. And how do I uh, deal with this kind of experience in my own life? And this has been, a, this I, I, I've, writ, I've written about, especially how do I remember that um, in my book, The End of Memory. And that's the kind of uh, tension, again, politically inflected interpersonal kind of situation. And finally, this was a book, Exclusion and Embrace, uh, war in former Yugoslavia, uh, which in which uh, most of the region where I was born was occupied. A uh, town that I was born in was encircled on most sides and, and was shelled by, uh, by enemy forces. And my question then was, well, what do I do? How do I respond? Not how do I respond as a, a, a kind of... Um, uh, immediately affected victim uh, of this, or even at a distance affected victim uh, of this. But how do I respond actually as a Christian? So that when I look at myself in the mirror and, and I see myself responding, I can I can kind of greet myself uh, and say, "You're responding in a way that is worthy of your Christian calling." So uh, that's that's the struggle that I've had in various um, uh, 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 kind of uh, wrongdoing situations. How does one remain on the one hand faithful to the cross of Christ, which is a message of forgiveness, while at the same time recognizing that very significant wrong has been done. And these two um, convictions of wrongdoing was committed uh, but a Christ uh, is the one who forgives. They are often at odds with one another. And uh, most of my work was an attempt to, uh, to deal with that, uh, that, ver that very, very situation, that, that, that spiritual struggle, which is an intellectual struggle, theological struggle, which is a practical struggle, which, which is a political uh, struggle. So you can almost say that all these lines from spiritual through theological to uh, personal to political, uh, they all coalesce in this uh, question of reconciliation very frequently, not always, uh, but very, uh, very frequently. And the other point that I want to bring, which, uh, which uh, might be clear from what I've said, uh, my, my reflection was primarily done from the perspective of the experience of victimization. That was my experience uh, in, in those situations. Now you can take the question of reconciliation and ask it from the other angle. And that's how we and how I, as a white person, have to ask the question uh, in terms of race, namely from the perspective of 
uh, kind of belonging to the group who were perpetrators and who continue in many ways to be perpetrators as we see uh, here. The same is uh, or similar situations are, are elsewhere. Now the perspective uh, from which a person who is a victim thinks so reconciliation and perspective from which a perpetrator thinks about it may be quite quite different, and I'm hoping that they can be they can be bridged. But um, so I speak here, uh, though I am a member now of the of the group of perpetrators, so to speak, at a, at a power side uh, of, of things. I find it then very important to emphasize that I am articulating my own take on things, my own experience. This is a less of a pres prescript, certainly not you must do this, but more, this is what I have found, uh, having been in situations of victimization, this is what I, how I have struggled with it. This is how I have uh, found way to think uh, through the Christian faith, uh, my own experiences and, uh, and hopefully uh, try to live it up. And one of the key things that uh, very orally I've discovered was this metaphor of embrace for reconciliation. And so I've used in most of my work, this uh, metaphor of, of, of embrace. It comes originally actually from the story of the prodigal son and my entire, this theology of uh, reconciliation that I will give you uh, can be teased out if you read carefully uh, teased out of the story of the prodigal uh, prodigal son. And of course you have there, you recall when the prodigal is returning um, before even he uh, repents or says uh, his, I'm sorry, uh, dad, uh, I, I've done, done a bad things, uh, thing, please receive me as uh, one of your hired servants. The father runs to him and embraces him. And that embrace then end up being the metaphor of what happens in, uh, in every uh, reconciliation. And shortly, I will analyze for you um, what I have uh, called phenomenology of embrace, uh, elements that are contained in a simple gesture of embrace that contain then, uh, or elements of a simple gesture of embrace that contain um, a, a then a kind of significant uh, insights uh, and perspective or from perspective of which one can think about elements of reconciliation as well. Now, uh, I remember uh, back when, uh, there's many years ago when I came up with that uh, image of, of embrace uh, and um, I was giving a presentation and it happened to be on one of those inter, inter um, one of those ecumenical and even inter-religious conferences. I was in Sri Lanka. At, at that time, and I was giving a presentation on this idea of, of embrace. And then the, there, there was a German professor there and there was an African bishop. And there was a kind of dispute that arose between a German professor and African bishop as to whether the metaphor of embrace is too intimate, uh, especially when one thinks about reconciliation between those who were, uh, those who were strange as, as enemies. And the uh, and the, the professor was uh, was advocating for a handshake at most, uh, and the bishop, the good bishop, was, was all excited about uh, about the embrace. And uh, later on, I didn't have enough presence of the spirit uh, to to uh, to say it during that conversation. But later on, I realized well, handshake is also an embrace, right? It's just that then uh, a hand is embracing another hand, but basically the act is the same. It's also true I realized that pinky holding a pinky is also uh, an embrace. And so you have this uh, category of embrace that can be um, seen, experienced in very diff different and varied, uh, varied ways. So this is by the way of introductory remarks. Let me now say uh, a few words about um, the, the elements of reconciliation taking the concept and the idea of embrace uh, as my guiding thought, break it up in its elements. So what, what, what happens when, uh, when, we, uh, when embrace happens, when we embrace uh, one another? 
I, I think the first uh, first element of embrace is opening of one's uh, arms. Um, what does the opening of arms mean? Opening of arms is a certain kind of a welcome. You are invited to reciprocate. You are invited not just to reciprocate, but you're invited in some sense to come, come in and to be uh, embraced. And that's a kind of opening of the self for the presence of the other within the bounds, within what belongs to the self. And there may be very many different reasons why we want to show this kind of uh, openness to another, uh, another person, even in the conflict uh, situations. Uh, it could be on account of our shared humanity. Because we are human and bound together in our common humanity, and because we are, uh, we, we are commanded by God to love uh, all human beings uh, as, as ourselves, all of our neighbors, we engage in this opening of arms as a form of invitation. It could be because of national belonging. We're all Americans, or we are all in um, whatever nation one might come, uh, come from. And that's the sense of belonging that motivates our coming together. Or we have a common faith. We are brothers and sisters uh, in Christ. Or it can be actually all three of these things together. Whatever the motivation is, this is a a kind of uh, gesture of openness. And it could be also that this openness, gesture of openness is um, a first step that one makes. Uh, other person may be holding their arms down and uh, well, somebody has to uh, extend one's, one's arms. Um, and I think that question of who comes first, which seems like a silly one from one angle, on the other hand, I think is a very fundamental one. And it has to do with the idea whether uh, in the order of things, forgiveness comes first or repentance comes first. And the forgiveness is simply a response to uh, repentance. Whether, the, whether a victim, the person who has been wronged has a responsibility to uh, or obligation before God to initiate the process of reconciliation even when the perpetrator does not or wrongdoer does not want to do that or does not isn't willing to make the first step uh, or it's it's the other way around and way I read the gospel and uh, of Luke is that the father uh, even though the son was coming back but nonetheless the father uh, embrace the son even before anything was actually said that corresponds to the fact that God forgave us or atoned in Christ for our sins uh, even before uh, we were born, even before uh, certainly we have committed any of the sins so that the, the gesture of reconciliation first step toward it belongs. Uh, uh, each of us is called obviously to do that but uh, even the wrongdoer uh, ought to uh, initiate uh, reconciliation. So that's the kind of signal by the opening of the arms. I don't want to be with you away from me. I don't want to be simply by myself. I don't want to be uh, close. I don't want to be in situation of enmity. I have a will, what I call the will to embrace. That's not an embrace yet, right? Opening arms, it's not yet an embrace. It's a will uh, uh, to embrace. And in some ways, it's a, it's a risky uh, endeavor. And especially because uh, I think uh, one of the st structural elements of, of embrace, and that may be uh, not so obvious, but as soon as you start thinking about it, it becomes obvious immediately. Uh, one of the structural elements of embrace is actually waiting. That is to say, you open your arms and now you wait for another person to reciprocate. You don't, you don't go and grab the person unless you know already that they want to be uh, embraced because uh, you two are old pals, haven't seen each other for I don't know how long, or this is your daughter who you're, you, you are embracing or your son. But if it, it, in a situation on en of enmity and wrongdoing, this gesture of waiting is an important because it, it recognizes that the other has a will of their own. 
they have to come on their own into the process of reconciliation. Nobody can be forced into it. And any forgiveness that is given or any apology that comes but and is forced will is likely going to be a false uh, apology uh, and false, uh, false forgiveness. And that's why this period of waiting is so, uh, so important. It may be a very short period, but it gives the other person freedom to be themselves and to act freely so that the process of reconciliation can continue. It's kind of, this is the signature uh, element of reconciliation is the idea of free uh, agency of both parties in the reconciliation uh, process. And as I've uh, briefly mentioned earlier, there is something like a like a risk involved in uh, in this in embrace um, in waiting period. Uh, the risk is that I will be rejected. The risk risk is that I would be laughed at. Uh, the risk is that uh, nothing would uh, nothing would really uh, really come of it. And suddenly, I'm not just especially if I'm uh, um, if I have suffered wrong, and I'm not just now one who has suffered wrong, I'm now being humiliated for the second time by the, by the perpetrator who haughtily does not want to receive and respond in a positive way to anything that I um, am offering to the person in terms of our uh, reconciliation. And I can be perceived as, uh, a, a, as a kind of weakling um, and despised precisely in this, uh, in this uh, form. So the first uh, element is opening of one's arms. The second uh, element is uh, waiting. And then the third element, you can guess it, of course, is uh, if it comes to an embrace, would be closing of arms around the other uh, person. Now, the, 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 this, this closing of arms uh, is a very interesting uh, thing, right? In, in a sense, the other person becomes the part of your own identity. It's almost as if by opening arms, you have opened wide the door of your very self. And in that act of embrace, you have included and placed the other person together with you into your very, into, 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 to be the very part of your, your, yourself, right? Um, so so it, it means that you're willing to expand your identity for, in order to make room for that person. Now, in the story of the prodigal, you see that uh, very, very easily in the contrasting images of the father and the, and the son. The father, the, the prodigal come, they embrace, and that embrace is being enacted. Oh, we've got a big feast. Come bring, bring me a good gown. Give me a... a, a, a a rope for the for the sun. Give me this great uh, great ring. Let's slaughter uh, an animal, and we're going to have a peace uh, a feast. The whole identity of home has kind of shifted now because the uh, prodigal has returned returned in. Father is willing to shift identity. The, the elder son uh, not so not so much. What's happening? He doesn't want to even enter because the home is no longer home that he knew, that he affirmed, that he recognized. He had no space to give to his returning prodigal uh, brother, which then means also, as illustrated in these two figures, the father and the older brother, which also means that the, the identity has to shift anytime it comes to a reconciliation. It has to shift, it, our identity shift uh, when wrongdoing happens uh, to us. For instance, for the, in the case of the, uh, of the prodigal son, the father of the prodigal son had to shift his identity from being a father of an intact family to a father of a prodigal, right? Uh, and if he has, had not shifted this identity, but disowned his son, uh, I am not, to be a father of the prodigal. Prodigal isn't my son anymore. I am who I am. None of the reconciliation would have, would have happened had he not shifted his identity when the prodigal came. Again, reconciliation would not uh, have happened. And these shifts in identity uh, are, are essential. 
I find that that, that requires um, a kind of dynamic sense of who I am and my belonging, willingness to go on a journey with somebody else. Without willingness to go on the journey, there's not going to be any reconciliation. Um, uh, some people would describe that as a compromise, right? Uh, but that's not a com compromise uh, is, is part of a kind of negotiating uh, settlement. This is something deeper than compromise. This is a shift of identity, recognizing that there's a story and story that involves wrongdoing in relationship that we have with other people. Now that to me, maybe I can make a small footnote, we can talk about it uh, later. That to me is one of the very central elements in, in reconciliation. If you think of your identity simply as, as unflexible, you define who you are and you have closed and, porous, and, and unporous boundaries, reconciliation won't happen because you, you're gonna be like a ball uh, facing another ball, your identity, and, and you'll just bounce off one another. It's going to be then uh, either capitulation um, uh, or victory or simply uh, a separation uh, of sides. And um, this kind of flexible identities are, are essential. Often in conflicts, exactly the opposite thing happens. Um, uh, uh, before we, be, before this um, session started, uh, we were talking a little bit about my experience of uh, speaking at the UN uh, when 9-11 uh, happened. And in the aftermath of 9-11, some of you won't re remember that, but uh, French were not so keen to support uh, United States in our, in our efforts, especially when it, when it came to, uh, to war later on. And uh, suddenly in the United States at the time, there were groups of people who would no longer call French fries, French fries. They, they, they call them freedom fries, which is kind of completely silly thing uh, to do. But idea behind that was we have no space for Frenchness on our table in our food that we really like, uh, like to eat. Uh, French is out. Uh, this is going to be a freedom fry rather than French, uh, fr French fry. You, you can see how identity is completely being enclosed and, and, and pushed to be clear, cleansed from, to expunge the identity of those with whom we are in conflict or who won't support us, in this case, in the conflict uh, and in the stance that we are taking in our conflict. All of this is to indicate this need for flexibility in the in, in identities. Now, um, there is also, and that's the last point that I want to mention in terms of the closing arms, uh, there's also a single uh, reciprocity. So it's not that embracing is not when I just put my arms around somebody, right, and they, they hold their arms down. Uh, embrace, properly understood, uh, involves two, uh, two people. And there, there's a kind of reciprocation that is, that is part of embrace. And you can see that also in, um, uh, when, we, when we think about uh, forgiveness uh, as a central element of, uh, of reconciliation, central element, uh, then of course, also of embrace. Um, because uh, forgiveness, if I can forgive someone, but if the person doesn't receive forgiveness, have I actually forgiven that person? Has forgiveness happened? And my theory of forgiveness uh, goes something like this. Forgiveness is like giving a gift to someone. So when you give a gift to someone, um, there is a giver, there's a thing that's being given, and there is the recipient. And the gift is given when the giver takes what they give and impart it to the recipient and recipient receives. When recipient receives the gift that was given, then you have the gift given. I think the same is true also of forgiveness. Forgiveness can be a unilateral gift and often is as such. But when I give the gift of forgiveness, 
The other person has to receive the forgiveness and to receive it as forgiveness, which is to say we that that person needs to repent. We forgive, uh, we receive forgiveness through repentance. Repentance are open arms to receive the gift of forgiveness. If the other person doesn't repent, a forgiveness has not come to its proper end, to its proper goal. It has been given, and the person who is given has done the good thing, good thing for themselves, good thing for the other person, good thing before God. But the end of the process has not yet been reached. I sometimes liken that to a gift that I might want to give to my sister. So I buy a gift, um, something nice, expensive, maybe a gift. I package it very nicely. I send it to, to my, my sister, and now it's on my sister's uh, table. And my sister's, my sister, it happened that we've had a little bit of a spat or something like that. So we're not, our relationship at this moment are not the best, that's, let's say, as, as an example. And, and she says, she's not sure that, whether she wants to receive that gift. What's this brother of mine trying to do by giving me that gift, she might think. And she tries to figure out whether she wants to receive the gift. Now I ask you, have I given my sister a gift? And from one angle, you would say, sure, I've given, I mean, it costs me money, it cost me time. I spent time thinking about what would suit her. Uh, I spent time uh, buying it. I spent time making sure that it's exactly what she would like and so forth. Uh, I send it to her and now it's sitting on her table and she won't, she's not opening it. Have I given her a gift? Yes, I have. She hasn't received it. So the gift got stuck between me who has given actually and her who hasn't yet received it. I take this to be very similar to when forgiveness is given by someone, but the other person does not receive it as forgiveness. So that speaks again to this need for reciprocity in reconciliation processes. It cannot be a unilateral process. Reciprocity must be there. And uh, the final element of, uh, of reconciliation that I want to mention is, um, and final element of embrace is, and you might be surprised at that too, is opening of one's arms wide. Now, you would think that embrace is done when I have closed my arms, but just think of it, if I held my arms all the time together, it would pretty soon turn out not longer to be an embrace, right? Pretty soon it's gonna be end up some kind of a, capturing some kind of weird squeezing that uh, that I won't let the other person go, but it would no longer be uh, an embrace. The structural element of embrace, I let the other person go. I let the other person be themselves. And so to me, that symbolizes the need in reconciliation to recognize the distinct identity of another person. Yes, I want to be enriched by the entity of uh, by by the by that person i'm hoping that that person would want to be enriched also by what i have to give that her identity or his identity will shift just like i think and want my identity to shift to accommodate but nonetheless i remain myself they remain themselves as well and that opening of arms lets each person then return back <clears throat> to themselves uh, and uh, kind of reconstitute themselves, so to speak, from anew with this experience that they've now had of coming together in, in embrace. There's this dynamic then between um, uh, discrete identities that come together, that are in a relationship to, uh, together, that are shaped by one another, but that have also their own stories and lives apart from that specific uh, relationship uh, as well. And when that happens, when the opening of arms happens and the person then is willing also to return, then the process of reconciliation has started going and moving toward what one might describe a full uh, reconciliation. Now, my final comment that I will make and uh, um, I have been speaking almost, uh, I think, over 40 minutes now. Um, time flies, uh, at least when you speak. Uh, 
Um, the, so the final point that I want to make is I mentioned then kind of the full of reconciliation uh, or ongoing, I would, it would be better to describe it as ongoing reconciliation process because something like a full reconciliation or something like a perfect reconciliation will actually never occur. And I think in this area, as in many others, uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And um, we, we are complicated and complex people. But let's take just one element of reconciliation. I haven't mentioned it yet, but it's also crucial. And maybe we can speak about it in, um, in our discussion uh, afterwards. And that element is, is memory, remembering. So I cannot forgive if I don't remember. I cannot, the person cannot receive my forgiveness if they don't re remember the way I do what has transpired between us. What I think might be wrongdoing from their part, they may decide, no, that, that's not wrongdoing at all. I, did, I, was, I was right. So, and the whole dispute ends up being who did what to whom and whether each of us sees this properly and, and, and rightly. And that's a good chunk of our debates about reconciliation are about the truth of what has transpired, right? But this truth of what has transpired is such a difficult thing to, uh, to achieve. If we want to achieve full truth uh, and be absolutely certain of what has happened and only then forgive and then the only then engage in the process of reconciliation, we'll never get uh, to reconciliation because we, we will never see exactly the same. We have to have a, a kind of sufficient uh, agreement. The, they, the, the, it, it, it applies also to other domains of reconciliation uh, process. Uh, let's, say, uh, let's say even forgiveness, process of forgiveness. I don't know how it is with you, uh, when, you when you forgive. I sometimes, depending on what kind of wrongdoing was uh, was uh, uh, was in place or what had happened, I sometimes uh, want to forgive uh, maybe right away or maybe after some reflection. I can forgive, uh, especially when I look at the person in the eyes, maybe, um, and and I say, oh yeah, I, I forgive. Then I go back home, I go to bed, and then in the middle of the night I wake up and say, what? I don't want to forgive that person. Uh, and, and then immediately everything that they've done uh, surfaces back. They don't deserve forgiveness. They, uh, you know, they want to know how to appreciate the for forgiveness. I'll have all, we can have all sorts of reasons why we want to take back the forgiveness that we have given. And I think forgiveness actually, the actual forgiveness of most people that I know and I speak to, proceeds in this giving and taking, giving a little bit and taking a little bit back. There's a kind of struggle to forgive and to keep the forgiveness going. If you think and if you expect that forgiveness to be perfect, it's never going to occur. It's going to die before it's even born. And so uh, this last point is simply to say that uh, essential from my perspective, and this, this will be disputed, uh, I know, um, and it has been disputed, Especially, essential from my perspective is to have a courage to imperfection and to not to despise imperfect, but to, to start with the imperfect and move deeper from there rather than wanting to ensure that uh, kind of a perfect reconciliation, full reconciliation occurs. My hope is in the world to come, in the kingdom of God, reconciliation will be full and perfect. I can give you a whole lecture about eschatological reconciliation, but I will stop right here. Thank you so very much. I haven't seen any of your faces. I don't know whether you're asleep or whether you are alive uh, at all, but, 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 but here it is. The only face that I've seen during this entire time with my own, which I always see and I don't need to see. So my friends, I hope uh, uh, you've gotten something out of my lecture. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the The reason you haven't seen anybody's faces is because uh, because there are so many people on the call. We have it set so they're not <laughs> they're not able to enable them, unfortunately. <laughs> if I'm complaining, it's it's about the entire Zoom experience rather than live experience. Well, I, I fully understand.
I know I would normally say this would be a great time to give a round of applause, but it's just me. You know, I, all I can do is, <laughs> but, but thank you so much. That was uh, really, really wonderful. Um, we do have some questions coming in uh, and uh, we've just sent another message in the, in the chat about it. Uh, so please go ahead and uh, send your questions that way. Uh, they're rolling in, which is very, very exciting. And uh, the first one I have is um, what, th this is from, from one of the students, what should be the government's role in reconciliation when it has enforced laws or policies that hurt people or people groups? Uh, is the government capable of an embrace kind of reconciliation? So thinking a, a little bit extending the individual or cultural to that political situation, I think. Yeah, well, I, I, I think I think some of that, especially when it comes to uh, to um, unjust laws, um, I'm not sure that there is much there to reconcile. Right, <laughs> there's something to change. Uh, um, there is uh, um, I, I, here uh, their unjust injustice has has to be uh, removed. It may be a slightly different situation if you have in mind uh, some of the government agents who act on behalf of the government and perpetrate the crimes. So um, how does reconciliation, for instance, apply in cases of police brutality? Does it apply? And uh, I'm, I'm not certain that I know uh, how to think well about this. Uh, I think what I know is that we need systemic kinds of um, changes. Uh, that's one, and I think most important side of uh, of things. It's not the only uh, the only one. How to think about reconciliation in this regard? Um, whether to think about reconciliation uh, is a, is a is an issue that is a little bit actually beyond my pay grade, and I say that with with all uh, without any facetiousness. Uh, a, a, a good friend of mine, Dan Philpott. Uh, has written a book not so, not so much on, on the kind of police brutality, but, but on government actors and reconciliation processes uh, that are essential uh, when something like that uh, happens. Uh, I'm I'm not very well versed in, in in the area. I would then advocate simply we need to uh, work on on laws that are uh, that attend to the systemic culturally ingrained patterns of, uh, of injustice, whether that's uh, in the racial situations or in other kinds of, uh, kinds of situations, uh, which mean ethnic uh, discrimination uh, uh, or, or other ways, uh, even uh, in political uh, situation, authoritarian regimes, um, uh, all slew of laws uh, and um, government practices have to change. That's helpful, um, and th that's good. Uh, another question that's come in, and this was, I think, in relationship to the stuff you were saying towards the end about uh, one party uh, forgiving, like, like where, where does uh, reconciliation happen? Does it happen in the person who's giving the forgiveness or who's receiving it? Um, they, they're asking, what, do we, what if the person who, is, who was apologized to never receives that? Uh, so we've talked about that's not a full reconciliation, but I think what, what does that look like? Like, what should what should the person trying to forgive do in that in that case? Yeah, that that's a that's a very uh, very interesting uh, and an uncomfortable situation to be in. Um, depending on on the situation, you may be completely you may be exposed in some ways. Uh, it's a risk that you have uh, you have under, undertaken, and that's like you're standing with your arms open. And another person is 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 laughing at you. Uh, laughing in your face, and uh, you you have obviously been uh, been, been humiliated uh, in certain sense. Um, uh, to me, it, it it's really important that this entire process. And again, people might push back at that, but to me personally, uh, how I see things, uh, it's been really important for this entire process not to be reactive. That is to say, for me, not to uh, whether whether I whether I'm perpetrator or I'm victim, for me not to act toward the other person, say wrongdoer, 
in a reactive way. I will act if he or she acts in a particular way, and we're going to kind of negotiate negotiate our, our way. Um, it seems to me that I have a, this is my, my take on it, I have an obligation before God. I have to discharge that obligation no matter what this other person does. Um, I can give examples in many experiences, but one of my, my experience was uh, uh, in, in Muslim Christian dialogue, uh, way back uh, 2008, um, uh, I have spearheaded at, at Yale a response to a statement that a group of uh, high uh, ranking, uh, a group of worldwide Muslim leaders uh, have issued a common word between uh, us and you. And one of the things we, that we did in that statement is we apologized for the violence that Christians have perpetrated in history against Muslims. Um, big pushback against that idea. Why are you apologizing when they haven't apologized? Uh, and my response was, what does it concern me? Whether, wh whether, how does it concern whether I should apologize, whether they have apologized or not? Who, is, who gives a mandate for me to apologize? I think God wants me to say I've done wrong where I have done wrong and ask for, uh, for, uh, for forgiveness. Uh, for Whether they apologize for what they, they've done to me, it doesn't, doesn't matter for, uh, at all because forgiveness is not a matter of bartering and negotiating. It's a matter of fundamental moral stance. At least that's how I see that. And in that sense, I feel that... Um, for Christian, for Christians, forgive, uh, forgiveness is a moral command, and it's not a utilitarian move in the process of achieving certain preset goal. That is a that is a challenging demand. I think that's placed on us. Uh, one of the questions that's actually just come in about that was, what if somebody continues to hurt you? after you've seemingly reconciled. So there seems to be repentance, there seems to be forgiveness coming back together. And then again, like, what do we do about that? Well, we don't let us let them hurt us. <laughs> that is to say, we remove ourselves uh, from, from the situation to the, to the extent that that's, that that's possible. I, I don't think the obligation uh, to forgive in any way uh, takes away our duty toward myself or toward the broader family to ensure our own safety. By the way, I don't think that the obligation to forgive in, in any, uh, it, it does not exclude punitive measures toward somebody. I think what forgiveness excludes is retribution. Punishment as retribution. That is to say, when I forgive, to to someone, basically I say, I no longer count what you have done, your wrongdoing that you've committed against you. I release you from being held uh, to your wrongdoing. That's what forgiveness does. Now, that's incompatible with retribution. I can't then pay back, <laughs> pay the person back for what they have done because I've just released them of the responsibility. So payback and forgiveness are incompatible. But punishment can have other, other goals and purposes. It can be reformed of a person. It can be containment so that they don't do harm to that the person concerned or to other people. All of these functions of punishment are actually compatible with the idea of, uh, of forgiveness. And certainly the idea of striving to mo for moral reform of the person is compatible with forgiveness. Not only compatible, that's really part and parcel of forgiveness. There are uh, pieces of that that make me think of uh, the atonement and thinking of what, like what's happening there, what's the, uh, and how does that intersect with God bringing justice to his people. One of our readings this year was Hosea. And so we've been looking at that where there's this promise of, uh, you know, God's going to bring Israel back. He's going to restore them to himself. But then there's also this other side of that. There was a message of wrath, right? There, there's a 
the evil is going to be purged away. How do you see, I don't know if you want to wade into that, but how do you see that tension? Yeah, there's a, I mean, you can trace the, the, the kind of relationship between uh, wrath and punishment and uh, forgiveness through the, the, the scriptural uh, revelation. A um, most, most extraordinary uh, text, uh, will take long to, to discuss it now, uh, is in Exodus. Um, in chapter 32, the incident with the golden calf. Uh, covenant has just been all but tied up with the bow, right? Moses just has to go up to uh, to the mountain to receive. Uh, it's been ratified already with blood, right? And Moses just has to go go and receive the tablets, right? And to receive the 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 plans for the tabernacle where God's going to come and dwell among Isra uh, Israelites, which was the goal of the whole whole thing. And Israelites turn around. Uh, Moses is not showing up. They get scared and then start worshiping golden calf. And you have this negotiation that goes between Moses and God. God wants to destroy uh, Israel. And Moses brings God in, 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 in a mediating role, brings God to be the God who forgives until thousands uh, generations. Absolutely fantastic uh, passage where you have this kind of these two are just colliding with one another all the way I think through the through the New Testament I mean uh, think of uh, Gospel of John op opens up um, uh, and John the maps the sets of Jesus this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world now who's the Lamb the Lamb is Jesus but who is Jesus somebody else than God Jesus is not a third party Jesus is part and parcel of divine identity, which is to say when Lamb of God takes away the sin, God takes away sin places upon God's self rather than on either guilty, a guilty party or on some innocent third party. And so and the entire thing is not motivated by wrath at all, but it's motivated by, by love. And I think that's where in, in the end, the gospel, uh, gospel and uh, uh, Paul also uh, end. It is out of love that God takes sin upon God's self in Christ, so as to free us from sin. And it's this is tied to obviously um, uh, uh, forgiveness. That's why I think that cross is the end of retribution. Period. There's no retribution in the cross. Cross is not the end of all forms of punishment. I think, <laughs> uh, but a cross is the end of retribution of payback that's that's really good i kind of threw that question out there and that that has challenged the way i'm thinking about things now which is cool um uh, another question that's come in uh, this is about so we talked about kind of that community individual uh, dynamic so the the question is in the cases where someone harms or offends an entire community or group of people uh, is it possible for them to receive full forgiveness if only some members of that community forgive them? Or does that person have to live with the discomfort of that wrongdoing being left partly unforgiven? And I assume you could do it the other way where a whole group hurts one person or another group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, the, that's the really uh, challenging part of kind of collectivities forgiving. Um, and often what happens is uh, forgiveness happens in the name of a, a representative of a community speaks in the name of, of the community and then they are embodied in a particular person and that person then communicates. Uh, you've had many instances of this sort um, uh, throughout history and they continue to uh, to happen. The difficulty of course becomes that uh, not everybody sees that person as their representative. And so you have a, a split community and the representation is not, uh, is not complete. And there's no way to, um, I mean, you, you can then legally enforce that, but forgiveness uh, as a more subtle process 
would still then have to be added uh, to that process. And maybe a right legal action can be taken and certain forms of relation, formal relations can be established, but, the, uh, but this would be the beginning of a reconciliation process and not the end. And it might be, as it has been in, in many successful instances for, for a number of years, at least in South Africa, uh, not everybody agreed with the process of, uh, of reconciliation. There's a, a, a strong minority, I think, it, I think it was minority voice, but it was a strong and morally powerful voice, which basically said the, the blood of, of, of black people is too cheap. First, the, the, you, you, ex, uh, you exploit us and marginalized, put us in, in apartheid, and now we're just uh, letting you go. We're forgiving you. It just doesn't seem, doesn't seem right. And that kind of question, I think, is the big struggle of uh, uh, reconciliation at that larger communal uh, levels. And it almost needs uh, a communal transformation uh, and bold action of, uh, of some representatives of the community who see with moral clarity what needs to happen. And other hope, others hopefully will follow the suit to be partly persuaded, but partly also follow suit. Hmm. Uh, building off of that, you, you mentioned South Africa, and obviously you've talked about your experience um, in in Croatia, and you've also uh, we, we've also been obviously talking about sort of race relations in America. Uh, there, there's somebody who asked uh, for some narratives that you think are going to be helpful in terms of looking at reconciliation internationally. Uh, what do you see as the differences between those or the the lessons we can learn from each of those? If you want to bring other examples in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, those are those are all um, distinct, uh, distinct cases. I'm, and I'm not sure that I am. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the lessons that I've is, is what I've just just described as simply a, a kind of a difficulty or the lesson from the difficulty might be that you need to do uh, important previous kind of community uh, work and consensus, consensus building work within the community in order to, uh, to come up with, with uh, reconciliation. Uh, presumably in many instances, it's gonna, uh, uh, especially in democracies, it's gonna work that itself out through um, kind of elect, kind of general, general processes of the democratic, uh, uh, opinion building and decision uh, making. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't, uh, I, that's a bit beyond my pay grade to give you um, a comparative analysis of various um, reconciliation commissions. Uh, and there are many, many of them. Um, uh, and what, what could be learned uh, from each one of those? Um, that, that, that's really for political uh, scientists who study that particular uh, uh, field of studies. Uh, I, I think um, I, I don't know sufficiently to be able to answer. That's that's totally fair. Uh, <laughs> um, so one of the other questions, then this zooms back down to the level of the individual, is uh, does a? And I think this is related to thinking of like. Uh, the, sibling relationship a little bit. So does a child have the duty to extend an olive branch towards another party when their parents are not reconciled to that party? So the idea of uh, kind of the opposite of the prodigal son where the older brother might be willing to receive, but the, the father is not. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very interesting question. I, I don't think I've ever, I've ever been asked that question. And I, I, my sense would be that it really depends on how old the child is. Um, because I can imagine children who can be placed in a situation and maybe want to, many, many, uh, many um, especially small children, desperately, in cases of divorce or something, they desperately want their parents to be, to stay together. But it's, it's beyond their possibilities of understanding and, and the kind of emotional uh, wherewithal to be able to, to actually proceed with the course of action as independent uh, actors. 
Um, in other instances, I, I think uh, in the case of uh, larger family family feuds, but it seems to me that uh, the children can act as um, if they're adults, as independent actors, sometimes brokers of uh, of relationships. And I would, I would certainly want to want to say, um, if we can stand, uh, each are mature enough to stand um, on our own feet uh, and. Um, uh, have moral judgments formed um, uh, and character um, uh, suitable. I, I think we ought to we ought to be involved. It's not that it's not for everybody. The business of of, of kind of recon reconciling it, it takes it, it takes not only character and moral formation. It takes also a certain kind of uh, kind of skill. But certainly, an independent judgment seems to me as as quite an appropriate thing in those situations. Uh, the next question is uh, reflecting a little bit on our, ourselves or, or on the on the side of the the people who'd be doing the wrongdoing. Um, speaking of memory, so I think what you referenced at the end of your of your talk and the importance of being aware of a wrongdoing. How can we be more aware of our potential wrongdoings? How can mm -hmm. we be aware of the yeah? Yeah, um, I, I think. Uh, creating a space around us where those who depend on us, those who are weaker than we are, can feel safe to tell us what they think. We need to want to hear how we are perceived and what kind of life we lead in imagination of others. That's important for us as nations. That's important for us as uh, in our capacity as leaders of whatever sort, uh, whether that's of a small sub uh, group of co-workers uh, or in, in, in an educational set, uh, setting of a, of a group of students. Uh, or uh, as persons in, in, in families and in relationships. Uh, to me, that's really a crucial thing. Uh, and that presupposes that I am willing to honor the voice and that I want to submit myself to truthfulness, to truth about who I am. That's a very hard thing to do, though. No. And it, it requires kind of a spiritual maturity, uh, spiritual uh, strength. I mean, basically, you can you can easily see why a person would say, if truth is against me, why should I be for truth? Right? Why should it matter to me? I, I'm, I'm just going to completely cut myself off because I want to be who I want to be. I want to do what I want to want to do. We have been witnesses for this kind of attitude over the past five years in this uh, in this country. Truth does not matter one bit, right? But that's obviously that, that there is no porousness. Then there is no possibility of change. There is no possibility of any kind of bridge being built if I am unwilling to hear how other person perceive me and take it seriously. For that to happen, this other person has to matter to me. <laughs> and therefore the truth of my, his or her perception of me must will matter to me. And therefore our relationship will matter to me. It, my ego won't just matter to me. Right? And, and that's why in, in Exclusion and Embrace, my strong argument in the book is that in order to want to know the truth about yourself and about the relationship, I have a whole chapter on truth. Uh, you have to want to embrace the person. If you don't want to embrace the person, you want, want the truth. Um, uh, those whose deeds are evil, says Jesus in uh, uh, John 3, uh, 19 and 20, do not come to light. And the reason they don't come to light for their deeds to be exposed because uh, they're invested in those deeds. That's that's helpful. Um, do you have time for for one or two more questions? Sure. Um, 
wonderful. Um, so this is this is a this question is: Are Christians ever justified in being offended, or should we work towards never being offended? I don't know what offense means here, right? Meaning, yeah, uh, if it means ought I be morally disturbed that somebody has done some wrong against me or against somebody else? I think the response is, yeah, I, I ought to be. Ought I then stop loving that person? Response is, I, I should not. I should continue, right? So, so that that is the tension of, of reconciliation: naming the wrongdoing, but embracing the wrongdoer, right? That that that's the, exactly what's being what's being named, and so um, offend and love, uh, be offended and love. <laughs> you know, I, I, there, there's a big discussion was especially during. Um, some years, maybe, maybe 10, 15, 10, 12 years ago, um, when in Denmark there were these cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad that were drawn, and then there was a big uproar, um, and um, and then the, the statement, which I think is correct, was made by one of the Dan representatives of Danish uh, government in Denmark. Nobody has right not to be offended, <laughs> right? Um, I, 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 if there's freedom of speech, then, oh, then, then there is a right to say something that's also offensive, right? But the, the, I think the proper response to that is, um, f at least from my perspective, and that's how I responded in that, in, in that situation, if I have the right to offend, which is how it was justified while cartoons can be drawn, it doesn't mean that it's good for me to offend, <laughs> right? So the right, I, I could have all sorts of rights to do things that are not good. And I, as a Christian, ought to avoid doing them. That's, that's, a, that's a good point. <laughs> um, Last last question. Uh, we've read this semester uh, Marilyn Robinson's Gilead, uh, and I know you interviewed her uh, a little while ago. Uh, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that on that book or her work more generally in the, the themes of reconciliation there. I thought this would be a good time to, to talk about the intersection there. If you have any thoughts, <laughs> yeah, no, I I, I have. Uh, I, certainly, I have thoughts about Marilyn uh, and uh, Robinson, and I mean, I, I know her. I think we're um, we've had many different uh, exchanges, and I, I think worlds of her. I think that uh, her Gilead in particular, but also other books in the in the series, uh, including the last one, Jack, uh, are just splendid pieces of uh, of art and uh, extraordinary expression. Of the of the depths and subtlety uh, of, of the Christian faith, um, and expressed in such an incredibly beautiful uh, uh, and measured, um, yeah, way that, that it's. Um, and and I, I think generally, I I, I find uh, what she is she's writing, or even Jack has the scenes of of forgiveness. Um, uh, and and kind of inability and, and the struggle to live with with himself without being able to um, stop himself doing some harm that he knows that he has propensity to do but he can't control. Uh, th those, those are the struggles that many of us uh, experience, and she has articulated them in, in such a, such a powerful ways. Such powerful ways that that kind of reflects well the character of the uh, of the Christian faith. And one of the things that I've learned also from 
uh, one of the many, many things that I've learned uh, from, uh, from Marilyn is that um, you can't have, you see that in Jack too, uh, you can't have just this narrative account of identity, meaning that I am the sum of what has happened to me and what I have done. So I narrate this. Uh, and what others have done to me, what I have done to them. Now, if, if you have that context of, of identity, that, that account of identity, which many, many do, then I can never take out piece of my identity and release somebody from something they've done to me. They've, they've harmed the depth of my identity. Um, and, and once one has this, this account that I'm making myself and my story, and that's who I am, forgiveness becomes very difficult because forgiveness means that I am the deed that the other is, has done, wrongdoing that sticks on him, right? <laughs> and I take it and pull it off of him, <laughs> of her, and they're freed from that. Their narrative, it's almost as if they haven't done what they've actually done. Now, th that's the miracle of forgiveness that needs, to, that needs to happen. But how do I do that if then I would, my, my identity would be completely disrupted and, and, and shifted, uh, and I wouldn't then be myself. That's why we need richer identity, notion of identity that allows uh, things to be, what happens to us and what we do to be subtracted and to, to, to recede in the, in the background so that we can be then uh, ourselves, even with our sins <laughs> and with our sin and our sins can be uh, forgiven. That's why Ma Marilyn speaks of it in terms of soul. Uh, but that's, an, an, I, I think that's what image of God means. That's what means being beloved by God and, and having source of identity therein. So um, such, things and many, many more uh, are to be said in praise of Marilyn's work. Well, thank you so much um, for, for speaking with us tonight. Uh, this has been an absolute honor and I'm sure everyone is from their various homes and computers uh, applauding. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we, uh, we thank you uh, so, so much for, for being here again. Um, this, has been, this has been wonderful. Um, I do have, oh, no, go ahead, sorry. I just wanted to thank you for organizing it, for uh, leading it. Um, it, it. It has been a pleasure. Absolutely. Um, the, the only last things I have are some logistical notes uh, for, for the, the student body, um, just about the, the next couple of days here. So uh, to get credit for the event tonight, um, and just to mark that you were here, uh, go ahead and fill out the Google form that's gonna be put in the chat. Um, and then the other, the other thing to note is for the uh, final debate uh, competition at, uh, on, on Friday evening, uh, you have to, in order to be on campus, you're going to have to reserve your spot. And that's going to go out in an event bright tonight at 9.30 or at 9 o'clock p.m. Uh, and that's going to go uh, out on Schoology. So access your Schoology. You'll see that link on there. And you can go in there and you can select your house. Uh, and that'll give you a spot in your room. Uh, and if there's your house is full, then you can go to a random assignment and that'll uh, also allow you to, that, that's our like flux capacity. So you'll be able to, uh, even if we fill up your war room, you'll have uh, space there. Um, so uh, other than that, you can watch uh, remotely uh, as always, um, but thank you all for being here tonight. Make sure you fill out that form and uh, post wonderful things on social media, uh, <laughs> acclaiming uh, Dr. Wolf and, and his time here with us tonight. Um, but. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thanks so much. Farewell. Well.